from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, my name is Kahin Mohammed, and I'm a program specialist here at the Library of Congress's Young Reader Center. And I want to thank you all for coming here today. Um, Oyster Adams is a really big friend of ours, and we're really appreciative of you coming out. Um, I also want to thank Tulane University, Vanderbilt University, um, CLASP, um, also Center for the Book, and the Library of Congress as well for hosting us today. We're very, very pleased um, to have Duncan Tuatu here. Um, to read his book and also discuss with you all today a very important subject matter and a topic and we hope you all enjoy it. So thank you and um, we'll have a question and answer session at the very end. All right. Hi everybody. Good morning. Buenos dias. Um, so my name is Duncan Tonatiu. O en español todos me dicen Duncan. Duncan, Duncan, and, um, and I write and I illustrate children's books. And, um, and so this is one of the, the books I've made. And so what I thought I'd do is I will, I will go over it quickly for those of you that don't know the book. And then I want to show you a little bit of, um, of the process of making the book, tell you a little bit more of, of why I wrote the book, and um, show you some other... Uh, uh, pictures, and I want to make sure I give you guys time to ask questions. Maybe I'll show you some of my other books um, if we have time. Uh, does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, okay. So the book is called Separate is Never Equal, Silvia Mendez and her family fight for desegregation. And this story is a true story. It happened about um, 70 years ago. And, um, and so it starts here, and this is the first page, and we see that Silvia, right? She is, uh, she's very sad, and it's her first day at this new school, but a boy a white boy points at her and says, you don't belong here, go back to the Mexican school. And so Silvia doesn't want to uh, talk with anybody that day. And when she comes from home from school, she tells her mom, mom, I don't want to go to that school anymore. The kids are mean. And her mom says, Silvia, que no sabes que por eso luchamos? What does that mean? Que no sabes que por eso luchamos? Yeah, don't you know that is why we fought? And so then Sylvia remembers all that had to happen uh, so that she could go to that school. So she remembers how she moved from the city of Santa Ana in California to the town of Westminster. And in this town, her family was leasing a farm. And in the farm, they were, in a, they were gonna grow asparagus, tomatoes, chilies. And then, because summer was almost over, Silvia's aunt, her aunt Soledad, drove Silvia and her brothers and also her cousins, Alice and Virginia, to the local public school so they could, um, so they could attend school when it started. And they went there, and Silvia thought it was a really nice school. It had those tall trees in the front. There was a nice playground in the back. And when she went in there, when they went in there, her aunt Soledad talked to the secretary at the school, and she said, I'm here to, to bring um, my daughter, Alice and Virginia, to the school, and also my niece, Silvia, and my nephews, Gonzalo and Jerome. And the secretary said, your daughter, Alice and Virginia, can come to the school, but Silvia and her brothers, they cannot come to this school. They have to go to the Mexican school. And Silvia was very confused when she said that. She said, why do I have to go to a Mexican school? I'm a US citizen. I was born here in the United States. My father's from Mexico, but he became a US citizen. My mom is from Puerto Rico, which is a US territory. So why do I have to go to a Mexican school? And then she wondered if it was because of the color of her skin or because the last name was Mendez.
And so Hernan Soledad talked to his secretary and said, but we all live in this part of town. We sure that all the students should be allowed to go to school together. And the secretary said, no. The Mendez children have to go to the Mexican school. So Hernan Soledad and said, I won't be enrolling any of the students at this school then. <coughs> and so she drove back to the farm and told Silvia's father, Gonzalo, Gonzalo Mendez, what had happened. And he said, oh, it must be a misunderstanding. I'll go talk with the principal or the superintendent or someone at the school. So he talked with the superintendent, a man named Mr. Atkinson. But Mr. Atkinson said the same thing. The Mendez children have to go to the Mexican school. And Mr. Mendez asked, but why? And Mr. Atkinson said, that's the way it's done. The Mendez children have to go to the Mexican school. So that fall, Silvia and her brother had to go to the Mexican school. And the school was on uh, Olive Street. Uh, and and every, everyone called that school on Olive Street the Mexican school because that's where all the children of, uh, of Mexican parents or all the, Latin, all the Latino children were sent. And the school was a clapboard shack. It did not have any, um, there was no playground. Um, the students had to eat their lunch outside and it was next to a cow pasture. And, uh, and that fence that kept the cows in the pasture had electricity running through it. So if any of the kids touched it, they would receive a shock. But the worst thing about the school was that the teachers there they didn't care about the students' education because they thought they would all drop out by the time they were in eighth grade. They thought that they would stop going to school and they would just start working in the fields. So they didn't really pay attention to, to their education. And Sylvia's family didn't think that that was fair. Her parents didn't think that was fair. Sylvia didn't think that that was fair. So her father decided to write a petition, write a letter saying that all children should be allowed to go to school together. And he tried to get other parents that had children in the Mexican school to sign it. But the other parents were scared to sign it because th they thought they would get in trouble or lose their jobs because their um, bosses were white. So they, so they didn't want to sign the petition. But Sylvia's father didn't give up <clears throat> and he kept talking to people. And one day a truck driver that went to, um, to his farm to pick produce told him about a man named uh, Mr. Marcus. And Mr. Marcus was a lawyer and he had helped the people of a nearby city uh, the, in the city of San Bernardino to desegregate the public pool. Because at that time, not only in the 40s, this story takes place in the, in the 40s. Not only were, the, were schools divided, but also other places like parks, public pools, movie theaters, and children like um, Mexican-American children or African-American children, Asian-American children were not allowed to use them or were only allowed to use them on certain days or, cer or only certain parts. And so <clears throat> Mr. Mendez decided that he was gonna hire that man, Mr. Marcus, even if he had to spend all his savings to do so so that he would help them um, desegregate the school and make it so that all the Mexican American children could go to school with, um, with the other children, with white children. And so Mr. Mendez and Mr. Marcus started traveling to the different towns and cities in the county, in, in, a, in a county named Orange County. And, and they talked with other families because it wasn't only Sylvia and her brothers that weren't allowed to go um, that were sent to the Mexican schools, but there were thousands of children in the area that were sent to, to the Mexican schools. And, um, and so while Sylvia's father traveled around uh, trying to get more families involved in the case, Sylvia's mother had to, to do all the things that, that Sylvia's father usually did. Her mother, Felicitas, had to drive the tractor and, uh, and take care of the farm and do all, all the things that he usually did. And Mr. Mendez was able to, to get um, different families involved in the case, like the Estrada family. And Mr. Estrada, he had fought in, in World War II for the US Army. But when he came back, he, he saw that his children weren't allowed to, to go to school, uh, that they were sent to a, to a separate school. So he didn't think that that was fair. So he decided to join the case. And several more families of the different cities and towns in Orange County joined the case. 
And on March 2nd, 1945, the lawyer, Mr. Marcus, went to a courthouse in Los Angeles and filed a lawsuit. <coughs> and so what that meant is that the different families and different superintendents and teachers from the schools would come to a room, a room like this, or even larger than this, and at the front, there'd be a judge who would listen, and, and the different lawyers would ask people to come to the stand. And so, for example, on the first day, Mr. Marcus called to the stand uh, Mr. Kent, and Mr. Kent was in charge of, was a superintendent from one of the schools in, um, in the area, and he asked him several questions. He said, why do you send the Mexican-American children to a different school? And he said, oh, it's because they don't know how to, how to speak English. And Sylvia was very upset when he said that because she knew how to speak English perfectly well and no one had asked her or given her a test to see if she spoke English. So that was not true. And then Mr. Marcus kept asking questions and then um, Mr. Ken started saying some very mean things like that the, he said that the Mexican children always had problems, they were always dirty, they always had dirty hands, face, neck, and ears, that, uh, that they were inferior in their ability to behave and their ability to learn and, and their ability to participate in the school. And so the Mendez Summit was very um, upset when he said uh, all those things, but it was, but those things that Mr. Uh, Ken said was, were things that a lot of people at the time believed and had that same attitude. And so the trial continued for several more days and, and so every day different people were asked to come up to the, to the stand and they were asked questions. And so for example, Sylvia's father came up to the stand and Sylvia's mother and Mr. Atkinson from Sylvia's school. Um, and Sylvia herself was not called to the stand because she, uh, she was still young, she was like eight years old. Um, but a girl that was a little older named Carol Torres was asked to come to the stand and, and she proved that she spoke English perfectly well and that it was not true that, that she was being, that the Mexican American children were being sent to a different school uh, because of language. And then they also asked questions to some uh, college professors, some education specialists that said that it was bad to divide children uh, because then it makes one group feel superior and one group feel inferior and that children should be allowed to go to school all together. And so the judge had to listen to all these things, right? And then he had to decide who was right, whether the, the school board, the people from the schools were right, or whether the families, like the Mendez family and the other families involved in the case were right. And so he took almost a year to decide, but he decided that the, that the Mendez family and, and the other Mexican-American families were right and that, uh, and that all children should go to school together. And, and so the Mendez family was very happy and the news appeared in local newspaper, newspapers, but they didn't have much time to celebrate because the people in charge of the schools appealed the case. And what that means is they, they ask a different judge that has more power to review the case so because they were hoping that he would change the decision. So this time, a judge in, um, in San Francisco in Northern California, because this was happening in Southern California, had to review the case and had to decide whether the Mendez family should win again or whether the schools uh, should win. Uh, but this time while he was deciding, different organizations that represented different kinds of people in different parts of the United States started sending letters to the judge so that he would, um, so that he would favor the, the, the Mendez family. And so, for example, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Japanese American Citizens League, the American Jewish Congress, and other organizations sent these letters. And on April 15, 1947, the judge in the Courts of Appeal in San Francisco decided that the Mendez family should win again. And that June, the governor of California signed a law that said that all children in California were allowed to go to school together regardless of race, ethnicity, or language. And so here <coughs> is Silvia, and it's her second day at the school. And do you remember when we first started the story, right? That's her first day at school. And she remembers all of this 
all the things that had to happen so she could go to that school, to the Westminster School. And so the second day at school, she doesn't, um, she doesn't um, listen to any of the kids that say mean things to her. And she realizes that other kids want to be nice to her and want to be her friend. And by the end of the year, uh, she makes a friend. And by the end of the school year, she makes lots of friends. Of, um, and she's friends with, with kids of different backgrounds and races. And she's very proud to be attending that school because her, her family fought very hard to make that happen. And that's the end of the book. Do you guys like it? Um, and like I said, this story is a true story. So here's a picture of Silvia um, when she was about 10 years old. And this is a picture of Silvia a few years ago um, uh, in 2011 when she received a medal. You see here that she has a medal. She received a medal from President Obama um, for, uh, for all her courage and all that her family accomplished. And here's a picture of um, Sylvia's father and Sylvia's mother. And that's a picture of the Westminster School that she was not allowed to go to. And that's the school on Olive Street uh, that everyone called the Mexican school that she had to um, go to. Do you guys have any thoughts or questions so far? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I had the chance uh, to meet Sylvia Mendes. So, so this story, I think, is a very important story, but not a lot of people know about it. I didn't learn about it till, till recently. I, I learned about it like, um, like three or four years ago. And there's a, uh, let's see, raise your hand if you heard of uh, Martin Luther King. Okay, put your hand down. Raise your hand if you've heard of um, Cesar Chavez. Okay, a few of you. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of um, Brown versus Board of Education. Okay, just a couple of you. So there's some civil rights leaders, right? There's people that sometimes you learn in school, like Martin Luther King, which most of you have heard about, that fought to, to bring justice and equality in the United States so that, um, so that people of different races could live and have the same opportunities. But there's a lot of other people that also fought for that that, uh, that you may not uh, learn about or hear as often. And so Sylvia's family is one of these cases. And there's a similar case that happened seven years after all this happened and involved a girl, an African-American girl that lived in Kansas that also, like Sylvia, she was not allowed to go to the school, to the public school that was uh, near her house, but she had to go much farther away to a different school that was only for African-American children. And, and, and her family didn't think that this was fair, and they fought, and eventually that, um, that helped, helped, it, um, that helped uh, make it so that all children in the United States um, could go to school together. And some of the people that were involved in that second case that's very famous and, and that some of you may learn about were first involved in this case, like the governor of California. He became a judge in that case. And for example, um, Thurgood Marshall, who was the lawyer in that case, he sent letters uh, for, to, for this case, um, for the Mendez case. Um, but so going back to what you asked, I only learned about this story a few years ago. And, uh, and I was at a book festival in Texas, um, and Silvia Mendez was there. And I had just learned about the case, so I had a chance to talk with her and ask her questions. And so a lot of things in the book come from, from uh, talking with her directly, and other things in the book come from uh, doing research and reading different books and reading different articles about it. Do you have a question? <clears throat> Is Sylvia Mendes still alive? Uh, yes, so let me show you guys some other pictures. Uh, how do I exit this, you know? Like make it small? <coughs> Thank you. So let me show you some more pictures from the time period. And I'll 
I'll show you a picture of Sylvia uh, nowadays. Okay. Uh, can you press down shift, please? Or can I maybe bring the that over here? Thank you. Uh, one moment. Well, uh, so here's a picture of Sylvia's parents, a picture of Sylvia's mother, and so I, you know, I looked at these pictures, and that's how I. I where my drawings, I try to, hopefully they look a little bit like them. That's the, the school that everyone called the Mexican school. That's Sylvia's parents, Sylvia's father, Sylvia's father and mother. That's Sylvia and her two brothers and a nanny. That's her a few years ago. That's her when she was 11 years old. That's her aunt Soledad that drove her to the school. That's the Westminster School. And that's a picture of Sylvia a few years ago when I met her um, and, and when I had a chance to ask her um, questions. So she's still alive and she travels often to different parts in the United States and, and talks about the case and about education uh, uh, with different students. She is I forget her age now, but she's going to turn 80 uh, soon. But she's a very active woman, and, and she's very, very nice and very friendly. Yes? Um, well, Do you want to wait? Let me bring you the mic. <clears throat> Are you the author and the illustrator? Yes. So I am the author and the illustrator. And um, so I want to ask you actually you guys a few questions about that. Um, So, well, here I just want to show you um, this really quick. So, like I said, I talked with Sylvia, and that was one of the ways that I, that I wrote the story, but I also learned when people go to court, there's a, there's a secretary or there's someone that types everything that people say. And so, for example, here, I, I was able to read transcripts of all the things that were said uh, during the the case, and you can see here what Mr. Marcus said, Mr. Holden, who was the lawyer uh, for, on the, uh, for, the, for the school board, and all the different questions and all the different things that they asked. I read through that, and then after reading some of those things, I used that for, um, for the story. I included some of that in the story. But if we go back um, here, I make the drawings, and I want to see if you guys notice anything um, let me go to a big image, or maybe even here. Um, do you, did you guys see how when I make my drawings, they're always in profile? What does that mean? Profile is when they're always looking to the side. We never see them looking with both eyes straight ahead. And do you guys notice anything else that strikes you about the drawings? Let's see over here. I have pictures in the drawings, okay. Uh, anything else uh, over here? Um, well, let's go back to your question in a moment. But does anybody else uh, perceive anything uh, different or unusual about these drawings over here? Okay, yeah, yeah, maybe like in this image, for example. Uh, let me find it. Uh, like here, right? Their body is, is facing one way, but their head is facing another, kind of. And does anybody notice anything interesting about their ears? Their ears look a little bit like a number three or a letter E, right? Does anybody, why do you guys think I make my drawings like that? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, let's see, maybe over there? 
Yeah. Okay, to make it more creative, that's part of it. Uh, anybody else here? To make it more real. To make it more real. <laughs> All right, so let me show you some drawings that inspire my drawings. And these are drawings that people made about 500 years ago. So these drawings are drawings that the Mixtec people made. And the Mixtec were an indigenous group uh, um, from the south of Mexico. And they would make their own books. Uh, and in their books, they told their stories about their kings and their warriors. Uh, and you can see that in their drawings, people are always in profile. They're always looking to the side and the ears. You can see here that sometimes look a little bit like the number three. And you can see that the hands are often kind of like this or like this or like that. And so I looked at those things and I thought that this art that people made hundreds of years ago was very interesting, very creative. And I kind of wanted to do something similar, uh, make drawings that are similar to those, but make them about stories that, hap that are happening now or that happened in the recent past. So if we go back to the book. You know, maybe you can see, you know, how the ears or the eyes are here. Maybe let's, the hands. I try and do it similar uh, to that style. But then, like you guys have noticed, then I also use pictures. Um, let's find a large image. And I use different textures. Have you guys ever made a collage? Raise your hand if you made a collage. Okay, you can put your hands down. So a collage is when you cut different types of paper or maybe pictures from magazines or maybe different types of cloths and you glue it all together to make a new image. So I do something like that, but I do it in the computer. And so I grab, for example, this brown paper and that's one texture. And then for example, this here, her skirt is a different texture. And for example, the shoes, Maybe I'll take a picture of something like a leather seat and then I'll use part of that picture to make her shoes and, uh, and that's how I, I make the illustrations. They, they notice the hair a lot. Uh-huh, yeah, so you can see the hair here. So that, what that is, I, I don't have my own computer here, otherwise I'd show you how I do it. But I, um, it's a picture, like I can take a picture of someone's hair or I find a picture of someone's hair or a wig on the internet and then I cut it out and glue it there. That's basically what I do, but I do it on the computer so it's a little neater because I'm kind of a messy, messy guy if I just use glue and scissors. Um, other questions? Uh, let's see over here. Uh, maybe I think they're gonna pass you the microphone. How do you make the, the pictures? Well, how about I draw on a piece of paper, right? Um, just like a letter size, regular piece of paper. I make a drawing with a pencil. So let's say I draw Silvia. And then after I like the drawing, I go over it with a pen. And after I draw with a pen, I use a machine called a scanner. Um, a scanner is a bit like a photocopy machine and you put on top of the scanner and it has a cable connected to a computer and it goes do, 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 do. and so then the, the drawing that I did on a piece of paper appears on a screen, like on a computer screen. And then on the computer screen I put the different uh, textures and different colors on it. Um, but what I want to do now is show you how I make a book because it's related to, um, to what you asked. Uh, how long do you guys think it takes to make a book? Any idea? How long do you think it takes me to make a book? 30 what? 30 minutes? <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, someone else over there? 
okay, a month or four weeks. Let's see back there. Yeah. A year maybe. Okay, so it usually takes me about six months, sometimes closer to a year. And so the first thing I do is, you know, I have an idea for a story. I write it out and then I send it to an editor. An editor is a person kind of like a teacher who reads it and then gives me comments and says, oh, okay, this is very good, but I'm not sure what's going on here. Or I'm not, I don't know if the ending is very good or, uh, but what happened in this part of the story. <coughs> so, you know, so what I wrote, for example, here is in black. And all these things in green are things that he changed or had questions about. So you can see that it never comes out perfect the first time. I write it out and then the, the editor crosses out all sorts of things and has questions and, um, you know, often in the side here he'll put uh, questions like, uh, but what happened to uh, Anne Soledad or what did she do after she took the kids to the school or, um, so you can see, so that's the first part. I write the story and then I revise it. I send it back and forth with this editor like four or five times at least till we're both very happy with the story. And then after that, and so that usually takes me about two months, sometimes more, till we're both very happy with the story. <clears throat> and then after that, I make sketches for the entire book. I draw just in black and white the entire book. So you can see there, that was my first idea for the cover. And the cover changed. And then here, you know, that's the, the first page in the book. And here a different person called an art director, she or he uh, gives me comments and says, oh, but maybe move this because uh, you forgot to include this. Like maybe she should have a lunch, uh, uh, a lunch bag or a backpack or maybe move the text a little bit because it won't fit. You know, like here it says maybe I should move it uh, up a little because otherwise it's going the, 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 um, yeah, to be too down. <laughs> yeah. So I get a lot of these comments and so then I'll change the sketches many times also and that usually takes me like two or three months. And then after that, after both the art director and I are happy with the book, uh, with the drawings, then I put the different texture and color in the book. Um, any other questions? You have a question? Am I already happy with the book? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with this book. Um, <clears throat> one reason why I decided, I, I made this book for, I had two big reasons um, to make this book. So the first reason is that I think it's an important um, piece of American history that not a lot of people know about. I think it's an important story that I think more, more people should, uh, should learn about. Because like I said, sometimes kids in school learn about important civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King or Cesar Chavez. Uh, but there, are, there were also other uh, people that also fought hard to, to bring positive change, create positive change in, in the United States, in America, and not a lot of people know their stories. So I thought that this story was important for that. But the other reason and is that, you know, because I'm an author, an illustrator, and, and I write books, sometimes I get invited to visit different schools in the United States, in different parts of the United States. And sometimes I see that schools continue to be very divided. Like sometimes if I go to school that's in a poor neighborhood or poor area, it's usually Latino children and African American children that go to that school. And if I go to a school that's maybe in a suburb where there's more money, it tends to be mostly uh, white children or Anglo children. So a lot of the problems that Sylvia was having 70 years ago are still kind of happening today. So I thought that was another reason why I, I should write this book and why maybe some of you will, will relate to this story. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. So how do you print the texture onto the picture? 
Um, so I do it in the computer and then gets printed by a printer. But when they print the book, they print thousands of copies. So it actually gets printed by large, large machines that print thousands of copies of, of the book and it gets bound. So I don't do that myself personally. It gets printed by machines. And so it takes me like six months or a year to make the book, right? But then after I finish the book, it takes like another six months for the book to come out. Because it gets printed by those large machines, then it has to be shipped in, uh, in boats or airplanes or trucks, be sent to different stores, to different libraries. And before the book comes out, they usually send some free copies to different librarians or teachers or people that write for magazines so that they will read the book and say, oh, this is a good book, people should buy it, people should have it in their school library or in their public library. Um, so from the time that I, that I uh, first have the idea for the book to the time that someone's actually holding and reading the book, it takes at least a year, sometimes more like a year and a half or two. Uh, yes, do you have a question? Um, well, I think you guys remember that Ms. Kleinman has been telling you all that I've been on this award committee, right? I've been telling you probably since last year, and I think I've showed some of you some of the books that we were reading and picking and thinking about carefully to see which books we were going to decide got this very special gold award. And if you see, my copy has one award. But if you look at Duncan's copy, it has three awards. Can you hold that up for them? Okay, so, so these children have learned about book awards because I've kind of been trying to explain to them what it's been like to be on the <coughs> committee. And so another thing that happens besides sending books to schools and libraries is when a book is a very important book for a particular group of people, what group of people do you think this book is most important for? Delara. Mexicans who live in Mexico? Mexicans who live in the United States? Only Mexicans? What do you think, Millen? I think it's for people from around the world that don't get the opportunity to read the United States. Do you mean people from all over the world who might not get to go to the best schools? Okay. Okay. Well, I don't want to take too much time away from the author because. I talk to you guys all the time, but I just want to say that one of the groups of people that Duncan sent this book to were three different, or, or probably his publisher, three different award committees. And all the award committees said, yes, this book deserves an award. And because it's such an important story and it's beautiful. And so awards, I mean, it's very special to receive an award. Um, but it's also, it also helps the book a lot because what happens, every year in the United States, there's thousands of children's books that get made, right? But only a few of them, only a small percentage, only a small amount, talk about uh, different minority groups, talk about African-American children or Mexican-American children or Asian-American children the amount of books that talk about uh, those people is very small. So an award like this helps it, helps more people find these books and, and, and shows that these books are, are good books and important books because you know, the United States is such a, a diverse country with different types of people that the books that get published and get printed should also be, should also um, reflect that. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is the t-shirt I 
made with one of my drawings. Um, most of the t-shirts I wear have my drawings on them. Um, but yeah, it's something that I've done for, for several of my books. So I've done, um, I've done, this is my fourth book that I've written and illustrated. And I have five books now because I have a new book that came out a couple of weeks ago. So I have five books that I've written and illustrated. And sometimes I get invited by a different, um, to, to make the drawings for a different author who writes the story and I make the pictures. Um, but I've done five that I've written and illustrated myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I do there, so in that machine, a scanner, sometimes I put something, right? Sometimes I'll put like my sweater on it, and then I'll see an image of the texture of my sweater on the computer screen, and then I'll use that. Other things, for example, like the wheel of a tractor, I can't put the wheel of a tractor on top of a scanner. So I'll take a photograph of myself, or I'll go on the internet, and I'll search pictures of wheels of tractors and I'll find one that I think will work. And so uh, by doing that, then I use a program called Photoshop in which I can kind of cut things and paste them in different areas, and that's how I build my illustrations. Um, here in red, yes. Um, did, um, when you were talking to, to Sylvia, um, did, did, did you, um, did she, when you wrote the book, did you remember, did she remember that you, that, that you, your name was Duncan, Tony and that, that you, 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 she had actually talked to you? Um, yeah, so I, <coughs> so I learned about this story from my editor, the, the person that's kind of like a teacher. He was, uh, he was working with a different author on a book that relates to that case that I told you, Brown versus Board of Education, and in there she mentioned the Mendes case, this other author. And then he said, oh, I think you would be very interested in this because he knows I'm very interested in issues that affect um, Mexican-American children and Latino children. And, and so, sa I, so I said, oh, yeah, this sounds very interesting. And I looked online, and I found out more about it. And then I happened to be in the same place where Silvia Mendez was going to be. And so I got to meet her and talk to her. And I told her I wanted to make a book. There's a different book that's been made about Silvia's story, and there's been some documentaries. There's a middle grade novel called Silvia Naki, which is for like kids in middle school. But I wanted to do a book for, for younger readers. And, um, and so I told her, and Silvia said, oh, it'd be great if you do the book. If you, if you make the book, make sure I wear trenzas, because I always wore trenzas uh, like that when I was a little girl. And, um, and so then I wrote the book, and then when I finished writing the story, I actually visited her in her home in California. She lives in, um, in uh, Fullerton, California, very close to, to, to where she grew up. And, um, and I showed her the story to make sure that everything was correct. And those pictures that I include at the back of the book are pictures she showed me and she gave me permission uh, to include in the book. And, and so this book has received uh, several awards and honorable mentions. And uh, it received an award um, some months ago, an honorable mention some months ago, and, and Silvia Mendez was able to come to that. And so I've seen her a few times, and I've had a, an opportunity to, to talk with her, and, and she likes the book, and she's, she's um, uh, happy with it. Uh, yes? What is the fifth book called? So let me show you really quickly some of the other books. I won't be able to read them to you because I know we're um, running out of time. We, we have, um, I believe it's Dear, Dear Primo, Dear Primo, and it's also Pancho Rabbit, um, and the Coyote, so I can show you at least two others. And so then I'll show you the latest one, which is called Funny Bones. Uh, and so some books that I've made are fiction, right? They're stories that I make up um, with people that, that don't exist. 
But other stories, like the, the, this book, Separate is Never Equal, and like this book, Funny Bones, are, are based, are nonfiction, are based on true people. So this is the story of a man named Guadalupe Posada, who was an artist, and he made, the draw, he made these drawings of these skeletons. And so I wanted to learn why did he make in these drawings of skeletons riding bicycles and dancing and playing guitars. So the book is a biography of him. I went to a library and I learned about his life and the different drawing techniques that he learned, um, different things that happened. Uh, and it's also about the Day of the Dead because he, he made those drawings for, for, for the Day of the Dead, which is a holiday. Maybe a lot of you know about it. That happens just right after Halloween. And so, I, so in the book, I talk about different um, Day of the Dead traditions, like, like doing these paper cutouts or, uh, or like making these sugar skulls or decorating shrines with cempasuchil flowers and pan de muerto bread. And then there's also this tradition of, um, of writing calavera poems. And they're poems that involve skeletons in some kind of way. So for example, this is a calavera poem I wrote. It says, it was a warm afternoon in the middle of May. Mr. Bones grabbed his hat and went walking that day. When he noticed a beauty on the opposite street, he ran towards her and kneeled at her feet. You're the prettiest girl I've seen in my life. Please marry me, please be my wife. I am sorry, senor, but that cannot be. You're handsome and all, but too skinny for me. <laughs> and so the poems are supposed to be silly and funny. And Guadalupe Posada, Don Lupe Posada, he drew, he made a lot of illustrations for those kinds of poems. So in the book, I put his illustrations and I asked questions about why, why he, he drew those images and tried to try to think of why he made those images and ask questions about why, why he may have done that. And so that's the, the latest book I've done. Yes. Is anyone in the school? No, uh, in the in this book, in Separate is Never Equal. Well, the main character Sylvia, uh, she's still alive. I forget exactly how old she is now, but she's in her seventies, close to to being eighty. And her brothers are still alive. Her parents passed away um, some years ago. And what happened is when Sylvia's, Sylvia, after she went to the school, right? Um, uh, after, she, after she went to that school with children of all races, uh, she went on to middle school, high school, she went to college, and she became a nurse. And she worked as a nurse for a long time, for almost 30 years. <coughs> But then her mother got sick. And so she stopped working so she could take care of her mother. And when her mother was very sick, she said, you know, I'm so sad that n no one knows about our story and, and all the things that we did to make it so that children could go to school together. So Sylvia decided that she was not going to work as a nurse anymore and that instead she was going to start traveling and talking with people about this case so more people would, uh, would uh, find out about it. And, and, and in that room where she t used to take care of, of her mom when she was sick, now it's kind of her office and she has all these awards and all these different uh, pictures and recognitions for her effort, um, for her family's effort and for her effort to, so that more people will learn about this story and, 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 and to talk about education and equality. All right, <coughs> I want you guys to join me in thanking Duncan Tuetui again for making time to come here today. <laughs> This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.